morning, everybody. This is Steve Alkett Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today, we'll be continuing our discussion on neurotransmitters. But before we get into acetylcholine, which is the next one up on our list, I want to revisit something we were talking about uh, on Tuesday that had to do with anxiety versus depression. So we were talking about GABA being a calming neurotransmitter. It calms firing nerves in the central nervous system. High levels improve focus, low levels cause anxiety, uh, also contributes to motor control. And so we were taking a look at, at where GABA kind of lives, and the, the answer was that we kind of felt like it's present everywhere, but it's uh, essentially most um, present in the center of the change grid. But when we talked about improving focus, we added a little bit uh, more of an outgrid sort of a plotting. So I don't know how this is going to ultimately look color-wise when I start to do blends and all that, but what I would like to do is just make sure we can visually indicate that while GABA may be present um, all across the change grid, it really is more of a, of a mid-grid thing at its essence and a out, little bit shifted out grid kind of thing when it comes to that word focus, which we had quite a little debate around. But one of the things that it said was that low levels create anxiety. And so I wanted to just revisit this diagram for just a second and see if we can talk about anxiety uh, versus depression. And so um, the thing we did talk about on Tuesday was, was reached the general consensus that anxiety is more of an upgrade sort of an experience. But I wanted to just throw out there, do you think anxiety also occurs um, outgrid? Does it also occur in grid? Is there anxiety down grid? So what do you guys think about that? This is Kathy. Uh, let me just take a stab. Um, I am thinking that um, it's possible to have it in grid even um, if you are looking at sort of the the uh, nearer the center aspects of in grid not not way out necessarily yeah. but yeah and so, somewhere in there um, where anytime your ability is less than your challenge I think is a time when anxiety can be provoked or, mm -hmm. or, el or elicited is, is how I would look at it yeah, and adding to that, these intensity bands we, we uh, have going up, certainly that wouldn't be as intense a feeling of anxiety as being in the upgrade danger zone. But I think you're right. There's kind of a an anxiousness. Maybe we wouldn't even describe it as anxiety. Maybe it's more like an uneasiness mm -hmm. or, you know, a little puzzle, a little discomfort, uh, something like that, as opposed to full-blown anxiety. Um, yeah. And, and then I also thought, well, if we talk about the, that Ingrid um, danger zone's worst possible expression, it's that person who is very much victimized by others, that it has zero self-esteem, that exists but doesn't really live. Um, and I can see where there could be an underlying um, nervousness, if that's even a word. Yes, yeah. Uh, if that's where one would be. So no imminent threat, but always the fear uh, that the um, the abuse or the whatever will happen again, you know. Uh, why would I disappear into the wallpaper unless I felt there was a reason to disappear into the wallpaper? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, so I think that that element is there. Other thoughts about on the Ingrid side of things? Is that is that anxiety? Okay, then let's go to the other side because I was also quite curious about outgrid. So if you're in a situation where your ability is extremely high and the challenge is also extremely high, and we often use uh, an Olympic athlete as kind of like the, the poster child for that, uh, well, the healthy part of that outgrid, uh, uh, dangers of the driven driver, are they anxious? Do we use anxiety to describe what they might be experiencing? Well, they could be. I, I think it would be um, an individual, you know, ab ability to manage that, mm -hmm. uh, manage that tension. 
Yeah, and I, I think that Jane, you're 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 kind of in the same spot I was when I was thinking about watching a star athlete just before their event begins, and they're kind of like doing a little shake awake kind of a thing. You know, they're trying to get some of that energy out. They're maybe pacing around a little bit, jumping up and down a couple of times. You know, whatever their sport would kind of lend itself to. And I thought, well, what's that all about? Is that about shedding excess energy so that uh, and is that that then in uh, you know a form of of anxiety so like does anxiety require that someone feels as though there is some sort of physical threat um whether it's real or whether it's vividly imagined is that a requirement for anxiety as a word to be used in fact just a second i'm kind of curious joseph in dutch is there a special is there, are there different words for what we're describing in terms of variations on anxiety? Well, I will, um, thank you for asking. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, sure. Well, I was just wondering if I uh, understood the word anxiety uh, proper. <laughs> because, yeah, well, uh, anxious, obviously. yeah, anxiety is, um, is kind of a noun form of the word uh, to feel anxious. So anxious is when mm -hmm. you kind of go like, oh, oh my gosh, any moment something's going to happen. So um, on the positive side mm -hmm. of things, we would say that if you're on a roller coaster and you're right at the top of the hill mm -hmm. waiting for that first big drop, there's a certain anxiousness there. You know, you're on the one hand mm -hmm. nervous, but you could also be excited, but there's this this um, anticipation that's going on. And on the negative mm -hmm. uh, expression of it, anxiety is a fear that something mm -hmm. is happening or is about to happen. And there's kind of like a, a dread sort of a thing going on with it. Uh, how mm -hmm. else would you guys describe well, it? Yeah. Well, we, we, actually, I, I was having trouble uh, translating the word tension because- uh, Verandering, the, the, well, that's change. <laughs> Sorry, I said I thought I said I, I said verandering, but that's actually the word for change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, we 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 call it uh, gespannen, mm. uh, uh, spanning, right? Right, so, spanning, right. So spanning has also a, a, a connotation of of, of stress. It, it's it's mostly used interchangeably, uh, interchangeably. but uh, anxiety is like. I tend to call it nervousness. We have this mm -hmm. word in, in, in Dutch, nervous, gespannen. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's the words that we use. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, uh, yeah. So, so, so we have also a word uh, which is called, uh, it's not so nice in English, but we use it in, in common language, uh, like opgefok. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> <that's crazy. laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's like 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 real real tense and real agi uh, easily agitated. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and see that to me is kind of what that feeling might be if you're too far out grid. Um, mm -hmm. So, but anyway, there are all just these different forms of anxiety. Linda and I are becoming increasingly curious about um, uh, words that are used in different languages for things. Obviously, we're students with French, and so French has got all kinds of extra words that we don't have in English, and it's missing all kinds of words that we have in English that they've got no word for whatsoever. So, it's just been really interesting to go like, how, are, how do different cultures frame these different experiences? that we might describe using the same word, maybe they have totally different words for what those sensations or those experiences may be. Um, just to finish the, 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 the four possibilities, can you think of someone who is very far down grid um, and would they be feeling anxious? So well, if I'm down mm -hmm. in deep, deep apathy, I was, I was just wondering about, and I was thinking about uh, perceived ability and perceived challenge, if somebody who was really far down grid would have any concern or worry that maybe they were missing something and they might have anxiety mm -hmm. related to, you know, am I, is there something I'm missing? Is it? Yeah, right. Am I, or, yeah, am I kidding myself? Do I have, yeah. we've talked about an illusion of control. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so or, that, that's well, interesting. 
I would like to comment comment on Please that do. if I uh, if if I may. Yes. I I, ha I had a period in uh, like four years ago that I was uh, diagnosed with burnout, right? Mm -hmm. So I tried to apply um, tension management, so lowering my tension in my my bad days. So what uh, what actually resulted, and I I swung from a really up grid to really down grid. It, it was hard for me to 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 hit the center. Yeah. So 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 there's some relation between a, uh, I call it anxiety and depression in my uh, in my uh, mm -hmm. according to my idea. I didn't really understand it, but that's how I explained it. So depression felt exactly the same as as is overstressed being overstressed uh -huh. so i thought depression could could be in downgrade but not you're not you're not finding a balance so i wanted to ask you about that i mean well in fact that's the next it, slide i'm going to show people cuz th thank you for for mm -hmm. sharing that personal experience with okay. us because i think it very no much demonstrates um, why the change grid also has to be understood from a three-dimensional um, vantage point instead of it looking like this two-dimensional flat sort of diagram. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so since we've now brought that up, let me just say, let's talk for a moment about the dark side of the change grid. So the dark side of the change grid, and again, you guys have heard me describe this umpteen times, but for people who are listening or kind of new to this, if you were to print out the change grid on a piece of fabric, and then you were to lay that piece of fabric over a ball um, in such a way that the center of the change grid would be like at the North Pole of whatever that ball happens to be. And those four corners of whatever that piece of fabric is would drape down towards the bottom. And if they were long enough and I pulled them just right, I could get them all to meet at the bottom of the ball. So at the South Pole, if you will, of the ball. Can you guys all envision that in a three? way of thing yeah and so that would mean that these four spots that seem to be as far apart as things can possibly get are actually neighbors in fact those four red spots are the exact same spot and so we decided to put a, a diagram together using the adjective map um, to kind of demonstrate what happens on the uh, dark side of the change grid. And uh, so let me, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen this before, but let me reacquaint you with how this diagram is, uh, is created. So basically we have these four corners. If you see right here, I'm showing you like the corner of that piece of fabric and it had its own red spot and we pulled it over till it was at the South Pole. And I did the same thing. See here, ghosted, you can see the word upgrid. So that would be the upgrid uh, part of it coming down the upgrid danger zone. This here is the ingrid danger zone. I'm also pulling it towards the center. And this is the downgrid danger zone. And I'm pulling it up and towards the center. So can you guys all conceptualize how we have created this current diagram? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just pulled it all together. Well, when you pull it all together, you start to look at the different adjectives and things start to make a bit more sense. Do I need to zoom in on this? A I was just going to say, if you could you zoom in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, let's see what else, yeah. see if things will come yeah, I, up. I can't see a T, but that's, I'm not a good measure. <laughs> well, that's the, still, I'm going to go ahead and see what I can do. Ah, wonderful. Yeah, good. Good. You just have to learn the right way to wiggle your fingers and something sure. happens. Okay, so you know, uh, right now we're looking at, again, the upgrid danger zone being brought towards the, 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 the South Pole, the, um, the bottom. And you read these kinds of things and you see what happens when you're too far upgrid. Well, interestingly enough, we don't have the word anxious up there. Isn't that interesting? Maybe it's because I'm feeling it before it gets so severe it's even happening. But nevertheless, if you look at it, I'm still feeling threatened. Um, there are things feel dangerous, unpredictable, imperiled, doomed, delusional. So you should certainly feel that the intensity of these words are getting, um, well, you know, stronger and stronger as you approach that, uh, that uh, powerless point. So... Um, 
if that's what anxiety feels like, now let's just go and look at what's happening in the downgrid descriptors. Now I get, well, right there is depressed, uh, unavailable, unconscious, despondent, remote, moody, negative, lethargic, withdrawn. You can see, you can read all these that you really want to see what's really going on. So as Joseph was really sharing, um, it's not at all unusual for someone who is dealing with anxiety or depression to actually be dealing with episodes of both. Because, and I can certainly understand how anxiety could lead to depression because anxiety is a physically, emotionally, intellectually exhausting thing. Anyone who's ever had an anxiety attack, you know that when it passes, you are left absolutely um, obliterated uh, when it comes to physical, emotional, and intellectual energy. So it's more like the depression is just kind of like an after effect of a, of a heightened period of anxiety. The other way around, I don't know that I, I uh, understand so much, do people get to be so depressed, so gloomy, so negative and moody and despondent that they suddenly have an, an anxiety episode? Or is that not necessarily traveling that direction as well? What are your guys' thoughts about that? I, I don't well, know T, what, what I was going to, if I can just comment here, I'm just looking and Googling and just let me just list the definition. The American Psychological Association defines anxiety as an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased, increased blood pressure. Oh, hmm. um, so that's, I just wanted to throw that in for whatever that's oh. worth. Um, I don't know if that helps at all. Well, I mean, yeah, it helps us to understand how the how these words are being done. Jo uh, Joseph, you were about to say something. Yeah, well, I was th thinking about the the illness is called manic depression. I understand that it, that it's it's uh, periods of of extreme uh, like not happiness, but but uh, mm -hmm. extravagance, mm -hmm. and yeah. and and periods of real depression. So it, that tends to be uh, switched on and switched off. Uh, yeah, yeah. Bang, bungling between between uh, uh, upgrade, really upgrade danger zone and uh, downgrade grid danger zone. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and I think that you know bipolar disorder is probably the yeah. the, the other label we would give to that. Um, yeah. 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 And now we really are looking at something that is severe swings, and um, so for some people, we know those swings can happen in an instant, and others, it mm -hmm. seems to be a little bit more. There's more of a progression between the two extremes. So you're you're absolutely right. But we're definitely on this dark side. You know, when someone goes from being manic to being depressive, or goes from being anxiety ridden to being uh, de you know uh, lost in in depression i don't think they go through the center of the change grid on their journey no i would think they yep. go to the outside or from the pole pole to pole pole to pole and this i think helps us see how that is so possible when we can add a three dimensional element Mm -hmm. uh, to this. Well, and by the way, you know, we didn't talk about the outgrid words or the ingrid words, but just take a glance at some of those. So how many people go from being very, very frightened and, um, you know, feeling frozen and imperiled and terrified and their way, way of dealing with it is to become domineering? Mm -hmm. And aggressive and because, you know, we talk about fight and flight. Well, this is the fight that's, uh, that's happening on the outgrid um, a little contributor to the dark side. Uh, and on the Ingrid side of things, now they become avoiding, cowardly, mousy, um, what's these, like, oppressed, exploited, spineless, victimized. So, you know, that's another way of dealing with whatever this threat is that is happening on this, um, on, on the dark side. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that, that it would be an extreme reaction because because if you're you're coping with extreme uh, upgrade uh, uh, tension, mm -hmm. then you want to relieve it. And my reaction was, okay, let's do all the things that bring me down. <laughs> that was right. kind of right, 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 right. Rational yeah. idea. 
but yeah. then you end up really downgrade. <laughs> well, and see, that's so. the whole point of like, if we are using the change grade maneuvers uh, well, then we are going to be able to feel a gentle movement, upgrade, downgrade, ingrid, or outgrid. Um, and you are right. Very often people will do too much of a particular type of maneuver and end up creating the opposite problem. Hmm. And so, okay, it might be different than it was, but it's still too much. It's still problematic. And uh, so, so there we go. Edie, you got your hand up. You're welcome to just chime in whatever you'd like to say. Uh, wait, Edie, you got two. You're here twice. Let me make sure. Okay, I've unmuted both of the possibilities, so you feel free to chime in anytime you'd like. Um, okay, so. Now, one of the other reasons why I wanted to bring this up was just to see how is this currently playing itself out in life in the good old USA? So, you know, um, without getting specifically political, are you guys thinking, or I'll just, I'll throw this out as my observation. I think that our, uh, our population is um, nowhere near the center of the change grid. I think as we started talking about earlier on in this whole series for whatever variety of reasons uh, there, there may be, we've all been moved further and further away from the center into one of these danger zones. And while we might have talked about, about how some people have been moved very far up grid or certain situations, move them very far up grid and others very far out grid. And some have just thrown up both hands and said, I just can't even participate in it anymore. And now they're very far down grid or they don't think they can have any impact whatsoever. So they've moved very far in grid. Isn't it interesting when you go, let's take a look at the dark side of the change grid and see if this is describing the way that we are watching uh, people interact with one another right now, watching the way people are behaving. Um, so, um, so you, you guys think that might be an interesting thing to take a quick glance at? <laughs> so, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, T. Because last week when we were talking about cortisol, I was thinking that when people are stressed, your body dumps cortisol, and if the whole population is having cortisol dumped into their bodies at rapid amounts. Mm -hmm. compared to the past with all the things that are happening. What is a whole country filled with cortisol acting like? Yeah, yeah, right. Because uh, cortisol was, a, uh, Brian's not on the call, but uh, the, he said that's characterized by stress. That's the stress um, neurotransmitter. Was that right? I think that's... It's, it is, and it's, um, it's, a long, it's a hormone, so it's mm. longer lasting, like yeah. You know, when you look at epinephrine, norepinephrine, and um, those, they, they just are, they only last for, you know, just seconds. They kind of wash in and wash out, but mm -hmm. cortisol is uh, much longer lasting. And if you have, um, um, if you have it for a long time, if you have high levels of it for a long time in your system, um, it leads to all kinds of issues like hypertension and yeah, yeah. chronic um, chronic pain and, you know, all kinds of chronic diseases and... Yeah, in fact, someone said that it's actually uh, too much of it for too long becomes a toxin. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Another thing that um, high levels of cortisol over long periods of time can do is, is um, affect your vision. Oh. And decrease. I, I know someone who uh, is diagnosed with um, macular degeneration who found that Cortisol, the doctor said that cortisol was one of the high cortisol was one of the causes. Oh. So um, I hadn't heard that, but that makes sense with, with my glaucoma. I can imagine that high levels of cortisol can, can wear away at your optic nerve. I mean, I don't know, mm -hmm. but, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's not listed in the neurotransmitter list that, that you shared with us, but it's definitely a hormone. Yeah, well, I do think, you know, after we finish this little series, it might be interesting for us to take a look at the hormones or other, you know, the other things in our bowl of soup. Um, just see how they're affecting, but I'm, I'm finding this really interesting to just go like, all right, so when we're on the dark side of the change grid, um, is this just an expression of what's going on with um, our current neurotransmitters and hormones? Is this something that is really 
uh, becomes part of who the person is, you know, because we, we've always said placement on the change grid is entirely based on the situation at hand. Um, so what's going on here? And again, I know I'm babbling a little bit, but I'm just thinking about the way that I'm listening to people interact with one another and I'm looking at the kind of, of conversations that are happening online. And I go for watching people that are very alarmist, feeling very threatened, feeling doomed, etc., And then they become intolerant and, well, I don't know about warmongering, but not a, not a far step out of the way, controlling, dictating, all this sort of stuff. And then, so these are the, the more active uh, kind of expressions of, um, of those energies, where these other two, the in-grid side and the down-grid side, tend to be the more passive of the two, so. I'm, I'm looking at this and thinking from a, from a cultural point of view, you know, saying, to what extent, because I do think this is reflecting a big portion of, of American society right now, not the whole of America, but a big yeah, portion yeah. of American society. I'm wondering if, um, and I have to think that this is correct, that if these patterns are in place long enough, essentially they, they take over and start dominate, basically dominate over the long-term mm -hmm. cultural patterns. Um, and I wonder about the resilience of the culture, you know, and its ability yeah. to bounce back yeah. Um, yeah. from prolonged uh, exhibition as uh, to what extent these become the actual cultural patterns over time, uh, mm -hmm. given what we're dealing with right now. Well, I think you're 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 right, and you have a I know you have a strong background in anthropology, and so there's got to be countless examples of when things have um, devolved into. Well, I'm thinking I'm thinking of the American Indian population. I mean, look yeah. at look at what's happened to ind indigenous people and um, how they've how how their patterns have devolved um, into sort of in grid and in down grid, um, mostly down grid levels mm -hmm. and have actually become stereotyped by their inability, you know, I mean, it's all part of structural racism, but their inability to, to move beyond and get beyond because of structural factors in, in society, but it's taken on a cultural pattern. Yeah, very. It's. I think you're absolutely right. And oh, as I as I've been looking at these, I'm going like, you know, th this upgrid section and this outgrid section coming together. This is what war is all about. These two energies are very much ready and willing to fight with each other. Um, and we, we are warmongering right now. I mean, I yeah, think we have I the think very on. close. Yeah. Well, it's true. Yeah, it's people true. And people who are want to, you know, get have a civil war, start yeah. a civil war. Yeah. I don't think we're far from that. No. I really don't. No. 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 Well, it's really bad. Can I can, can I can I throw in some uh, stories sure. from Amsterdam? Please do. <laughs> because I'm wondering. Uh, so so this is the story. Uh, we have riots in Holland right now. So mm -hmm. that's so that's strange. This mm -hmm. is a very uh, easy company, and we smoke weed and all this. Yeah. But, no. <laughs> enough, but, right? but, but now you, you now we have youth uh, rioting on the street and, and and attacking police so this is not very normal no and th the, the explanation that the youth has we have been locked up too long so oh, wow. i was wondering even in the, the 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 situation in the states how is this combination of locking up people uh, during uh, covid and no. a, a, a racial tension uh, creating a, a, a dangerous cocktail. Yeah, oh, no, I think you're 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 definitely identifying a, a reality for a great many people, um, and certainly it's the outgrid people and the upgrid people who probably have more of a natural hunger for social connection, uh, for getting out there mm -hmm. doing things, which is the. The, the main driving force for the outgrid person and experiencing things for the upgrid. I mean, I, I tend to be more of a downgrid type. I tend to be more of an analytical type and I'm an INTP. And so I'm kind of going like, oh, yay. <laughs> I don't have to go do much of stuff, <laughs> you know. So for me, I haven't felt any any real loss uh, at all. If anything, I have felt relief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, like, yeah. Like me. 
Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of people I know who feel that way. I mean, part of me feels that way as well. I get it. You know. Yeah. But many, yeah, yeah. And even then, though, but you know what? Even then, uh, we we were commenting for the first several weeks how how oh, this is so nice to not have these social obligations and all this that we have to go yeah. and blah blah blah. But at a certain point, you kind of go like, okay, well, um, <laughs> a little bit would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, uh, Joseph, I think you're absolutely right. There are people who have um, just. Well, we know that people, there have even been suicides because people uh, felt such extreme confinement. And I, you know, I, I think it was interesting talking to um, our uh, colleagues in the French club. We didn't have anywhere near the lockdown that a lot of places in Europe had. We weren't forbidden from leaving our homes. Um, you know, we didn't have to explain why we could only work on you know, days in or odd days and even days and all that sort of stuff. So if anything, we had it easier. And nevertheless, um, we still had that impact. But I think we have a, have a, have a much more warlike, aggressive culture to begin with mm -hmm. um, is part of our, because of our individualism and our sense of adventure. And it's not that it's, it's warlike necessarily at heart, but it can be when stressed and when triggered, um, but, but our individualism and our, our sort of sense of entitlement as a culture, um, those, those aspects of our culture, um, we have yes. fabulous, fabulous traits as a culture, but those aspects of it and the kind of aggressiveness that can be an American trait, um, I think comes to the fore under, under the stress of being bottled up and bottled yeah. in. Yeah. And again, as Linda was pointing out, that's, that's cortisol. It's what happens when you have a, a never-ending stream of cortisol um, coming through, coming through you. And so, um, yeah, well, anyway, I just wanted to throw this out there just to kind of uh, help you guys understand why, how it's possible to go from being very anxious to being very depressed. Um, and by the way, horizontally, we can also see a dynamic. And uh, now we'll talk more about the people that are too far out tend to become the perpetrators because, look, they can be autocratic and brutal and cruel and, uh, you know, do dominating and demanding and manipulative and all that sort of stuff. And meanwhile, you got the people very far in grade who are avoiding and cowardly and subservient and fragile and weak and, you know, all these sorts of things. Well, how often have we heard that, people who are abused ultimately become abusers. And so are these also compliment or the people who are, who are taken to task for their brutal behavior suddenly want to present position themselves as being the misunderstood victim of somebody else. And so I think while we might have this vertical um, uh, relationship, I think there's also a horizontal one that uh, right. comes into play as we understand the full range of human behavior. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Now going back to the warmongering, warmongering thing, it's the alarmist, threatened, um, fear mongering that's happening up grid that's going to come into direct contact with the air conflict with this uh, very outward aggressive sorts of stuff. So they're going to want to seize control. These people are going, yeah, but we're out of control. And unfortunately, it, uh, it isn't bringing in um, the balance and the balance we need from having people who really understand it but that's the downgrade people and the downgrade people have given up. And then there's the ingrid people who still are the voice of humanity, but are so, um, I want to say, oppressed by all this other, this extreme energy that they're reluctant to say or do anything. It's just not their, not their way. So two observational groups, the downgrade people will ultimately write all about it. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll document the history around it, but it's, uh, it's, it's not good when, when the world lives on the dark side of the change grid. So, okay, uh, final thoughts about, about that or do we all need to just <laughs> burst into <laughs> tears? No, I, I could lighten up the discussion a little bit. Please do. We have the, we <laughs> so in sales, we have these this, uh, this, uh, sides also. You have aggressive salespeople mm -hmm. and you have People, uh, especially like trainers or, or, or people who, who mean it good, 
that you say, well, a good salesman needs to be in balance, but you have still have trainers who push and, and uh, evoke aggression into, into a salespeople. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's on a small scale. <laughs> yeah, I know it's absolutely true. And then you, you know, talking about war sales, if it's not done in the way that we like to think it should be done, it is adversarial. And it can be very aggressive and it can be a form of war because how many people who are in a sales profession view their prospects as almost being the enemy because the prospects don't want to do what the salesperson wants them to do. And so, you know, why, why does everyone have to put up their defenses? And so I think you're absolutely right. There is a form of, of battle that can occur among people who don't understand that sales is really about helping people and not everybody needs to be helped and everybody, not everyone is ready to be helped. And so that's going to affect your closing <laughs> rate, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, uh, you're still protecting the relationship and in the long run, that's what's most important. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Very interesting. Okay. Well, wasn't that just uplifting? So, um, uh, any other questions, comments about the dark side of the change grid? No, I think it's interesting. And I, I think it, it, it will be useful to maybe talk about this again at some other point in relation to these neurotransmitters. I think making those connections is really helpful. And, and you know, how much of it is adrenaline? How much of it is, is well, um, yeah. you know, GABA or lack thereof, you know. Right. Well, and in fact, in because it. because we've already talked about the neurotransmitters, we've talked about and because I just said that I believe it's the upgrade danger zone and the upgrade danger zone that are in the most um, volatile conflict with one another. All we have to do is scroll back yeah. to uh, the diagram that was about uh, epi uh, adrenaline or uh, epinephrine. Yes, right, right, and exactly. there it is. Yeah. That's it all is. that red zone. That's the upgrade danger zone. That's the outgrid danger zone. Look what's fueling them. And, and by the way, if you uh, then add to it what's going on with dopamine, the dopamine levels are also quite pronounced at those two extremes. And uh, dopamine is that one that... Um, wants more dopamine. So you become kind of, we use the word addicted, but you become kind of uh, fixated, if you will, in whatever your position is. Mm -hmm. And so, yes. you know, you, you can't, you're not going to do better by staying in those extremes. We've got to find this, this center ground. And oops, well, I'm just messing up all my diagrams. You're, you're getting today. rewarded. Um, in whatever way, you know, for those extreme positions, which is happening now. Absolutely. You know, right. We're getting rewarded for that. They're going to do it more and more. Yep. 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 It's, it's sad. The, what the whole world needs is if we could just release a whole lot of Zoloft into the air supply. <laughs> Is there a way to do that? Put it in the water supply. The whole world just needs more serotonin, a little bit more GABA. Well, you don't know, you know. <laughs> yeah, or who, for all we know, I mean, we've seen enough science fiction to know maybe they're putting yeah, gonna say, in the water. Yeah. That's yeah. it. What the That's world needs on. now is love, sweet love. Need love, I was exactly. Say. And it's so far, looking at the ones we've been looking at, it seems like serotonin and GABA. Well, oxytocin, they need to drop some oxytocin. Yeah. Right. I, I feel like I'm reliving the 60s here, you know. It's yeah, really there you funny. go. I have a question about oxytocin, um, and that is, I thought oxytocin was the, was the drug that was used to stimulate labor. So how does that, how does that work? Is, am I right? That, I've well, never heard of that. Yeah, it is. Um, pit pitocin is what they use to stimulate oh, labor contractions. Okay. Is, and so the, I have to dig so far back in my memory. That's probably a synthetic um, oxytocin. But, you know, oxytocin has all kinds of um, uh, uh, neuroactive, you know, activity. So it indu it induces letdown of breast milk and mm -hmm. in in um, increases bonding between the baby. So when a baby and mother are breastfeeding, they mm -hmm. both have oxytocin uh, levels are increased, and that 
leads to bonding. And even with your dog, just staring into your dog's eyes, they see that um, oxytocin is increased in both the dog and the person. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of, so it's Pitocin is what they use to induce labor. Not, yeah, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering. Yeah, and I think, I have to look, I'll look that up really quick. You know, I, think I used to watch a lot of those medical dramas, and I just remember they were going like, you know, give her some oxytocin, whatever, you know, I forget what, whatever the whole dynamic was. But, I think uh, the toxin is, a, is a, probably a synthetic. A synthetic, drug. yeah. Oxytocin. All right, so, uh, but back to that, we need, the world needs less dopamine and uh, less, uh, uh, what else? Less more, more, more GABA and more serotonin. More GABA, <laughs> more serotonin. And so um, well, we only have a few minutes left, but I'd like to, to move on to the next little neurotransmitter. And that was acetylcholine. Um, so I'm going to read what uh, our little chart says about it. And you can see why I have um, the diagram I've thrown together there. But acetylcholine is a learning neurotransmitter. I'll give you a heads up now. The real question is going to be, what do we mean by learning? And if learning takes different forms under different circumstances, are they all supported by acetylcholine or is something else going on? So acetylcholine is involved in thought, learning, and memory. It activates muscle action in the body, also associated with attention and awakening. So just based on that description, I hear a lot of mid-grid stuff going on, and I hear some, um, well, not up-grid, but some up-grid maneuvery kinds of things going on, like increasing attention, increasing awakening, activating muscle action. That all feels like an up-grid uh, response, but not necessarily being up-grid, you know what I mean? Uh, but thought, learning, memory. So if I said to you guys, where... On the grid, would you say someone has best access to memory? Where is best access to memory? I would say it would probably be um, in the center or, you know. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. I, Because I, you, you have access to all of your, all of the pieces there. Mm -hmm. in the center yeah i share that same thought is that if i go like where where am i likely to have the highest quality in my memories um the broadest range in my memories uh the ability to um I want to say to experience the memories or to, no, have the memories without re-experiencing them um to me feels very mid-grid so and I, I, I said that because I, I want to make a distinction between having a memory that triggers me to have the same response I had. Right. Because it doesn't feel mid-grid. But being able to have the memory and stay detached from it, objective around it, that feels very mid-grid to me. So I thought for, that uh, yep. it would be downgrid. Well, and see, that's where I kind of thought like, well, but when it comes to to learning something and remembering what I've learned, well, I would say that mm. the downgrid spot mm -hmm. has learned the most. Because look, their ability exceeds the challenge. They figured it out. So if we're mm -hmm. just looking at learning as the, the accumulation of data or the accumulation of, I was going to say truth, but that's such an interesting word these days, isn't it? <laughs> um, that, that feels kind of downgrid, which is why I decided to put this blue blob down there. Um, and then I, because they use this word learning and I thought to someone who's upgrade, are they in a learning mode? And no, 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 I don't think so. Well, what if I said learning uh, as expressed in problem solving? No, that, that, that's in power. That's in power. So if you are up there in power, stress, or even stress, there's no figuring something out. There's no, we're not learning. I think there's figuring something out through action learning. Um, okay. Yep. Yep. That's, what, that's, yep. that's how I would state it, through the, through the action. And the, and the people who tend to be in, whose social styles or whatever, tend to be more upgrade, 
expressive mm -hmm. tend to focus on action learning versus database learning All versus right. intellectual yeah. learning. Yeah. Okay. So they're learning by doing. Yes. And, uh, and because of their heightened level of tension, they're doing whatever it is that seems doable at the moment. You know, they're, yeah. they're trying whatever route, particularly if they're up in stress. I mean, think what stress sounds like. I know I need to do something. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. So if someone throws them a life ring, they're going to grab it. Or if they see a way out, they're going to take it. Um, it really isn't, as you've pointed out, a logical process. It really is driven more by the, uh, the threat of the moment or the, um, the emotionally charged um, aspects of that situation. Mm -hmm. Is that feeling right? Yeah. Well, I, I thought I thought you could distinguish between uh, mem uh, retrieving memories and creating mm -hmm. memories because uh, emotion uh, tends to uh, to anchor memories into your brain. Yes. So when I see an advertisement and it evokes emotion, I remember it. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. something different than retrieving the information. Yeah. That and so if we said, like downgrade. where is where is memory retrieval? Um, that does feel more downgrade to me again, because where is where on the grid is my is my greatest body of knowledge, my greatest body of what has been learned. Yeah, it's downgrade. Definitely it's going to be downgrade. downgrade. That's where it, the collection is. It, That's the file cabinet. Even even uh, like uh, there are some programs that uh, teach you to learn uh, while in a really relaxed state, uh, like yes. even into hypnosis so sure that's also interesting about this uh, uh, creating memories but intellectually so so the distinction between intellectual and emotional that could be mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. even uh, according to learning right 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 and then you know just to add even more to the mix outgrid <laughs> learning Outgrid learning, I know for certain happens because this is a person who is actively, deliberately, consciously, intentionally pursuing something. And um, they, uh, you know, they're working to increase their ability to meet the challenge, to move further outgrid. So that to me, I could still use the word, I could still say learning is occurring, but how is that learning different than the upgrade learning you guys have always said upgrade learning is more of an experiential kind of a thing and downgrade learning which might be more about um to be downgrade i already have the information so maybe the learning is more about processing the information utilizing in the information to develop deeper levels of understanding awareness insight mm. thoughts about about that <laughs> I, I'm, I'm seeing it a little bit differently. I mean, I'm thinking, and let me just throw this out, that the outgrid is, the outgrid type of learning is taking um, or accessing um, the data, the information, and applying it. It's application, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's a it's almost a kind of action learning, um, but it's but it's intentional application as opposed to straight learning. So it's accessing what can what can be found up grid and what can be found down grid and in targeting it, fun, funneling it. Yeah, I like your word application. That's applied learning. Yeah. Um, because that would resonate again when we talk about the Olympic athlete. We know that excellence in any endeavor is going to be put to the test in the outgrid area. So, because that's where you're going like, okay, well, you say you got this ability, so let's give you a challenge to test that. <laughs> and you rise to the occasion. So you're applying whatever it is that you've learned. Um, and so I like this idea that upgrade, it's more about experiential learning or just trying whatever you can try. Because yeah, when I say it's experiential learning, it makes it sound like the person has deliberately decided to have experience. It's like, no, 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 this is just, this is a coping strategy that's happening that far upgrade. Uh, nevertheless, you're, 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 you're uh, learning by trying. And um, so outgrid then applied learning, you're testing yourself and downgrid is kind of like the the, the, I want to say the processing, the deepening, the um, uh, arranging, 
the um, researching the, the researching. researching yeah 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 forming procedures policies etc so that's a different kind of learning um now I, I always hate to be neglecting of the Ingrid side of things. It often does feel like the, uh, the abandoned child. But nevertheless, is there a type of learning that occurs um, in Grid? And if so, how is it different than the other types of learning? I see in Grid learning. Let me, let me try this on the group as, as the blocking, as, as Ingrid, Ingrid, the Ingrid state is almost the blocking of learning. Tell us more about that. I, I'm not. I'm. I'm talking intuitively, so I'm not sure mm -hmm. I. I know how to describe it. Um, it's just a feeling that I have that 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 it's the inability. It's it's the it's the you're blocking out what you're learning because it, what you may have learned either because it's painful, or it is pushing you in a way that you don't have the energy to manage it. So mm -hmm. it's it's. Um, you're basically saying, I don't want to learn much here because it will require me to act or do in ways that I'm not ready to do. Interesting. Uh, I think that's a really mm -hmm. Yeah, Edie, you, you, you go ahead and, and Jane. Yeah, I think there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. It depends if it's cerebral or it's, you know, we're talking about ex expressive. But is it cognitive? Is it cerebral? Or is it limbic? And when you're in grid, I think it's a more receptive way of learning as opposed to, you know, the out grid being more expressive. And when we're down grid, um, that's almost like an alpha state mm -hmm. where, yes, there's going to be more recall. For example, I've hypnotized people to find a diamond ring that was lost for 20 years. And, and so there is recall there, and it is where there's, you know, slower brainwave activity, which yeah. I would guess would be downgrade. But I, I just wanted to add that we're kind of forgetting the whole thing of whether it's cerebral cognitive or whether it's limbic. Well, and to build on that, uh, let me just draw to everyone's attention that if we look at the engagement rings, this uh, amiable area is all about pre-awareness, uh, just the, the very slightest moment when awareness is occurring. And so it does one learn um, in a, any kind of deliberate fashion before one is even aware, is, a, is becoming aware a form of learning. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. thinking that what I was just stating, what I was talking about was more the out grid, I mean, more of the, the uh, way in grid. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that what Edie was just talking about, I think that was Edie, but Edie yeah. was just talking about that receptive learning, that sort of intuitive learning is what happens in grid, maybe in closer to the, closer to mid grid. That's mm -hmm. what I'm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. does that, yeah, I don't know. That's my. Yeah, I, I'm saying the same thing, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think that it might be, and our, our time's up for, for now, but maybe on uh, Tuesday we can revisit this, but I'm very curious to know um, what, a, um, what the continuum of learning looks like moving from very far in grid to very far out grid. So if learning occurs all across that horizontal axis, how does it change itself? Because it's got to be a progressive thing. It's traveling along a continuum. Similarly, if there is a, is there a difference between the way that learning occurs vertically and does it originate either up grid, down grid, or is it something that happens from the middle and moves each direction? So, so um, I guess what I've just said is that at all times, under all circumstances, human beings are learning. But how that learning is taking shape um, or how that learning is actually happening, whatever its mechanism, is going to be uh, different based on where you happen to be. Yeah on the I, change I, grid. Yeah, that's great. That's an interesting conversation. I mean, I, and I think I go back to this idea that, that when you are first popped out of the womb, tell me that that critter is not absorbing all kinds of information about the world all around. Oh, absolutely. 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 So. Kiki, I got to tell you, the father of psychodrama, J.L. Moreno, said that half of our mental health is determined when we come out of the womb, if we see ourselves as victor or victim. 
Ooh. and how that whole birth, birth process was. That's a whole other subject, but I just had to throw that in. Yeah, but it, it's evidence that learning occurs mm -hmm. immediately. Maybe even learning. Yeah. Well, we talk about people like while you while you're well you, uh, before your baby is even born, start playing classical music and read because yeah. you're going like no, there is even an in utero um, uh, learning that that's occurring. Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the one of the things that I do that I used to do before COVID for many many years is cuddle neonatal preemies, mm. um, and and so you know being with holding neonatal, you know, little teensy right. babies, very yeah. premature babies, they are definitely learning mm -hmm. <laughs> at every moment. I mean, you can feel it, you can see it in their faces, you can, you, you know, it's theirs. And we know it's happening in the womb, but, yeah, but yeah. so that notion of awareness. Now, I, I do believe that at a certain point in life or under certain life circumstances, people can stop learning or maybe they put up, as you were pointing out, blockades to learning that yeah. are so strong that they can no longer see the truth. They can no longer absorb. Well, and, and I think that's the dark side that we were talking about earlier about this culture, because don't you think that's happening in the, in, yeah. to many people in this culture right now? It, it's on the the far side of the ingrid. You know? Right. And so then does that yeah. mean there's a relationship between dopamine and a um, pause in learning or because I can certainly see how the person who is way, way, way far up grid has just moved into instinctual responses. Yeah. And because uh, they have to, they're in a life or death situation. And I can certainly see that the person of the outgrid uh, danger zone, uh, or the, forget that the powerless point, way that far outgrid, believes that they already know everything they need to know. Actually, that feels more downgrid. But, uh, but nevertheless, I can kind of see where there might even be a time when people go like, enough with the learning. You know, uh, so, that's, where you're, uh, that's where you're forcing your knowledge on others. That's where right, you're, you're right, right, right. Your you're imposing others. it yeah. down here. You're just kind of have this false comfort. Uh, but so I'm just kind of wondering, does dopamine interfere with learning or is there some other neurotransmitter that might come into play that says for whatever reason now learning is going to be interrupted, at least learning as we've described it so far. I and find this stuff fascinating. I think, see, I think that Ingrid, a good word for learning is avoid, to avoid learning. To, well, uh, to avoid learning, yeah, particularly as the awareness comes into play. <clears throat> But a great deal of this, uh, of this in-grid danger zone, the only word that I have to describe it is the person is oblivious to what's going on or whatever they are picking up on is not being picked up on at a cognitive level. So, so you know I, I, I heard, I, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Edie and, Edie and Joseph, yes. You know what I was just thinking, because dopamine is released with touch, and when she was, say, cuddling the babies, the best predicting factor of an IQ before five years old is how much they were touched. So then we start right. looking at what is released in terms of learning because of touch and other factors that release dopamine and how that correlates with mm -hmm. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, what did you have to say? Yeah, well, you triggered me about uh, stopping to learn, and I heard some wise person say two pre people are not able to learn, and one of them is the arrogant one, and the other one was the shy one. So maybe uh, that might add some. Yeah, well, you've some, just described some, very far out grid and very far in grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, one is reluctant, and one is just believes that there's nothing left for them to learn. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So 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 learning stops in the danger zones. But the, yeah. I think I tend to think that even the amiable and all of the uh, quadrants of the of the grid, they are they have different learning styles, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, based on what everyone has just said in these last couple of minutes, it would say that that the purest, uh, richest form of learning. Um, We'll say after the age of five, because I think that you guys are absolutely spot on that, you know, humans popping out of the womb are very different creatures than humans after a certain point in time. Uh, but it seems like it does have uh, radiates from the center of the change grid. And mm -hmm. as we move further and further away from the center of the change grid, um, the learning starts to change, perhaps the um, 
well, the style of the learning is changing, the intensity of the learning is changing, but uh, that would seem to indicate then that acetylcholine, at least as far as its learning quality is concerned, is something that would be um, something that originates at the center. So mm -hmm. that'll be fun. We'll yeah. see uh, who joins us. Uh, so, okay, so holiday weekend for all of us. Uh, yeah, Joseph, feel free to celebrate Labor Day. <laughs> <laughs> that's right cook up your hamburger i will yeah. technically it's monday you have to have burgers um and uh it's a day not to work so if you do nothing else just don't work <laughs> i thought i should fine. celebrate at work <laughs> yeah they, honestly i don't even remember what started labor day but uh you know so many holidays have disappeared like are we still so talking about labor right now yeah, 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 that's what we're talking about. It's, it's a mom holiday. That's what it is. <laughs> it's for all the moms to remember labor. <laughs> so, all right, anyway. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. There you go. Okay, have a good <laughs> holiday. Talk to you guys on Tuesday. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.